ministers of the Council of Europe and, of course, has been a member of the French National Assembly. Uh, joining him to discuss the India part of this conversation is Dr. S. Jashankar, who serves as the Minister of External Affairs in the Government of India. Uh, prior to this, he's been a career diplomat for about four decades with the Indian Foreign Service and has served as India's Foreign Secretary, uh, the top diplomat for the country uh, before. And prior to that, he has, of course, also been in the United States, China, Singapore as our top um, uh, diplomat. Now, outside of his tenure, he had, had a brief stint in the private sector. And as many in Delhi would recognize, he would uh, uh, outrun a think tanker in thinking up political theories and concepts in his free time. Uh, he's also an author and a writer of uh, some important publications. Uh, just to set the context, uh, ORF has been engaging on this very important bilateral for a while now. Uh, we uh, put up a robust series of conversations during the Portuguese presidency. We hosted a live event at Bled uh, in Slovenia during the Slovenian presidency. And uh, the French presidency actually uh, offers ORF and the entire community of thinkers to be more ambitious about our partnership with EU, a partnership that the minister has invested in, the prime minister has focused on, and has certainly been uh, an outstanding uh, or a rather one of the go-to relationships in these rather turbulent times. Uh, and as turbulence continues, uh, my colleague Harsh Pant, who's the director of the Strategic Studies Program at ORF, is going to pose certain questions to the uh, two gentlemen who are joining us this afternoon and try and decipher what lies ahead for the bilateral between EU and India, and certainly uh, based on the foundational and strong relationship between France and India. So Harsh, over to you, and thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, Samir, and let me also welcome everyone who is joining us today for this very special session, and especially uh, the two excellencies, Minister Ludrian and uh, uh, Dr. Jay Shankar, for coming together for this very special session where we hope uh, to be able to discuss some key aspects of the French presidency of the EU, uh, India-EU partnership, as well as India-French engagement that has been uh, blossoming and burgeoning over the last few years, especially. We, uh, I would also take this opportunity to invite the audience to send in their questions, uh, uh, to send in their comments, which we will take up uh, as we go along this conversation. And as Samir mentioned, at the time of great turbulence in global politics and global uh, geoeconomics and geopolitics, we are uh, at a very interesting juncture where we, uh, where we are looking at uh, India and EU and India-France relationship that are widely seen as two important anchors providing stability to this rather turbulent world. Uh, so let me begin with, uh, with the French minister, Le Drian, and, uh, and ask him to explicate a bit on the vision that France has for uh, India-France relationship, but particularly now that France has the presidency of the EU. Uh, for what his vision is uh, when it comes to EU and the Indo-Pacific and what role he sees for India in that wider matrix as he uh, as as EU uh, looks at for the next course of action emerging uh, in what is widely considered to be the center of gravity of global politics and global economics. Uh, Minister Lidra. I'm uh, delighted uh with this uh, conversation with uh, my friend, Dr. Jay Shankar, and I, of course, uh, salute him. And I'd like to thank ORF uh, for their invitation. I'd had the opportunity in April of last year to participate in the Raisina Dialogue in India, and I remember the very great quality of the exchanges and discussions that were organized uh, and the multitude of subjects that are at the heart of the relations between France and India. You know, France and India for years have been uh, in a strategic partnership uh, linked by uh, relations of great confidence and friendship. And uh, we are attached to strengthening the relations of a strategic nature between the European Union and the countries of the Indo-Pacific, in particular with India. And I would like uh, to say that uh, the French presidency of the European Union will allow for a strengthening of this partnership. You know that it is for the 13th time we are presiding over the Council of the EU, and uh, we will be organizing. We've already started organizing numerous uh, events around this presidency with uh, a central objective, which is to assert a more sovereign Europe uh, in a world of uh, uh, brutality, rise in power's conflictuality, uh, the uh, 
challenge for Europe is to assert its sovereignty of a strategic nature, of uh, uh, in economic nature, digital health. That is the objective. Uh, that is the, the strength, uh, the, the, the strong line of our presidency that uh, uh, Europe uh, and France uh, play its full role around uh, the uh, theme of um, power transformation of world relations so that we be able to play along our own logic in the partnership uh, with the Indo-Pacific in particular. And that is the reason for which uh, there will be, in the course of the French presidency, a forum on the Indo-Pacific. It will be the first event, uh, the first time that during a European presidency, there will be an event focused on the Indo-Pacific and the relations between the EU and the Indo-Pacific. It is a central element, which obviously will be based on the fact that uh, for a long time we've had a very special relationship with India that, of course, was uh, seen at the Porto summit uh, under the Portuguese presidency. And this uh, Indo-Pacific uh, meeting will be on the 22nd of February next, uh, where the high representative Joseph Borrell will be in Paris. And. Uh, I wish uh, for the presence, of course, uh, of our friend Dr. Jay Shankar, as well as other partners, in order to mark this uh, new situation uh, between the Indo-Pacific and Europe, and uh, to try and develop a contribution to peace and stability, regional peace and stability, and also the, in the respect of multilateralism, be able to support promote a mode of alternative mode of cooperation based on the rule of law and the ministerial forum, forum will be essential to start on concrete projects. What I wish is for this Paris forum to allow for a concretization of principles that we share on the uh, respect of law, but also a harmonious development as well as uh, a post-COVID recovery. So those are the fundamentals of what we wish to do in the short term in our relations with Indo-Pacific, which will, of course, uh, take support on the historical relations that we have with India. Uh, thank you, sir. And let me, I think uh, now uh, is a good time to turn to Dr. Jay Shankar to ask him about uh, both, I think, India-France relationship, because it has grown, it has, it has uh, burgeoned in the last few years from, you know, we are economic partners, energy partners, strategic, broader strategic partners. And of course, security and defense relationship is pretty strong. And as France take on this role uh, of, of the EU presidency, what are your expectations about the Indo-Pacific and about uh, the bilateral as well as the larger multilateral frameworks that we are operating in? Dr. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Harsh. First of all, let me say what a great pleasure it is to join you and the ORF at the event today. Uh, and I'm so glad that this is becoming a tradition uh, because I do believe that it's important for think tanks and for thinking people to actually pay much more attention to the growing relationship between India and the European Union. I'd also like to, of course, uh, give my warmest regards uh, across cyberspace to Minister Ledria. It's always a pleasure to talk to him, to talk to him, to talk with him to other people. So I can't really think of a better partner to have a conversation about Europe uh, uh, than, than Mr. Ledria. Uh, let me start with France. You know, uh, yesterday, uh, many of us watched the Republic Day Parade and we saw French aircraft flying overhead uh, at the finale uh, of the parade. Not just the recent French aircraft, but the earlier ones as well. And I mentioned that because uh, it's a very visible uh, example, uh, really, of the uh, strategic partnership between us. You know, it's, it's very easy to talk about uh, concepts like strategic partnership, but if you 
want a, a, a normal ordinary person to understand what it was about those aircraft which were flying over our heads yesterday sent their own message uh, now i would also like to remind people that this is a relationship which has steadily matured that it's something which goes back multiple decades but which has really grown a decade by decade uh, i i think uh, we need to remind people that after our nuclear test france was one of the earliest countries or definitely the earliest p5 country with whom we engaged in a positive format and uh, and since then as i said with every uh, uh, sort of with the passage of time really the relationship uh, has grown uh, stronger it's grown uh, it's grown stronger in multiple ways i mean if i were to because we use the word strategic partnership uh, there's defense there is nuclear there is space in each of these france has been a long standing partner a good partner a reliable partner uh, and one with whom uh, certainly it is the desire of our government uh, to grow the relationship uh, and take it to uh, higher levels uh, it's not simply in a narrow bilateral uh, area though obviously the bilateral relationships do matter uh, if you know if you were to look uh, at our coordination in the un security council uh, at the kind you know where where do we stand on the big issues of the day uh, terrorism uh, you know how did we you know what were our concerns about what happened recently in afghanistan uh, i i would suggest to you uh, that though we are located in two very different parts of the world uh, actually on the big issues of the day it's interesting how similar our thinking is and that to my view uh, is a is a very strong force which impels a uh, uh, closer uh, partnership uh, uh, i'm i'm stressing the strategic political issues but i also want to point out i mean it could be trade it could be france was by the way one of the countries which responded very early to our request for students to be able to work after they get their degrees uh, it's it's been very uh, positive in its approach to the indian community there uh, so i can think of multiple ways cultural social economic uh, technological business which which really uh, make a strong case now having said that uh, i think today uh, the the relationship which even otherwise is an extremely important relationship for us uh, acquires an additional facet as france uh, assumes the presidency uh, of the european union uh, as you know uh, last year at the porto summit uh, there were some major uh, decisions taken uh, decisions about resuming our trade and investment agreement negotiations uh, about uh, a connectivity partnership uh, in september uh, there was a indo pacific eu uh, you know uh, uh, eu strategy that was announced uh, and uh, 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 incidentally uh, you know uh, we should bear in mind that uh, france is both the chair of the indian ocean commission as well as the indian ocean naval symposium so given the india france connect given the fact that france has interest has a presence actually on on uh, both both ends of our of the ocean space uh, below us you know they are there uh, at the western indian ocean they are there in the south pacific uh, they are very much an indo pacific resident uh, presence uh, uh, given the fact that on the big issues of the day our thinking is very very similar uh, i think uh, 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 strengthening this partnership and focusing it on indo pacific is something which is uh, very timely it's very appropriate uh, which is why i very much welcome uh, the uh, eu ministerial forum that uh, france proposes to organize uh, next month uh, and of course it would be a great honor uh, to participate thank you uh, thank you very much sir and let me uh... I think both of you have mentioned uh, how important uh, in Indo Pacific is becoming and uh, and is at the heart of this conversation between India and France. Uh, let me invite uh, you know uh, uh, Minister Ludrion for 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 his comments on something which is I think on the minds of many Indians at the moment, looking at the situation in Europe. 
uh, because uh, you know what is happening in Ukraine, for example, and there are tensions uh, brewing there. Uh, now, uh, what is your assessment of the situation there? And especially, I think the worry in in some of the uh, uh, you know Delhi circles might be that, uh, or or in the Indo-Pacific might be that this would uh, distract EU. Uh, from the kind of focus that we had seen building on, on the Indo-Pacific, perhaps what is happening on the periphery or, or right at the center, at the heart of Europe today, will distract Europe from pursuing its very ambitious uh, multi-pronged strategy that it outlined last year in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, so I would welcome uh, any any thoughts, any remarks that uh, Minister Libero might have on this very contentious issue at the moment. Thank you. Thank you uh, to my friend, Dr. Jay Shankaran, on what he said on the very strong relationship uh, between France and India. Thank you for having reminded us that uh, the Republic Day has allowed for uh, the flying of French uh, planes, uh, the very concrete and visual translation of a strategic relationship that is very strong, because in history, I think that France has always been there for India, whatever be the moment uh, and the situation, the seriousness, our partnership has uh, never wavered towards each other. And we are in this uh, very deep relationship of confidence, which uh, translates, as Dr. Jayashankar rightly mentioned, uh, by not only a, a collaboration of security and defense, but also very strong relations in the economic uh, space fields. And I was able to note this in Bangalore when I went to visit uh, the Indian teams uh, uh, less than a year ago in April of last year. And uh, then, dear friend, you also emphasized the importance uh, of the collaboration between our students and uh, also the importance of multilateralism and our collaboration in particular within the United Nations. And it is this same spirit that we wish to find uh, again in the Indo-Pacific strategy, which is a European strategy, because the European Union has uh, uh, decided on a real project of collaboration between Europe and the Indo-Pacific. And obviously, in the Indo-Pacific, India plays a key role. And in this spirit, I'd like to come, before I speak about Ukraine, to come back to the forum that we will be organizing now, we want the forum to be articulated around three uh, areas, security and defense, uh, but also that of connectivity and the digital and uh, global challenges and the participation of all the stakeholders in a certain number of essential questions concerning the common uh, goods We've already evoked uh, these subjects to preserve an Indo-Pacific which is governed by the rule of law and uh, that the European commitment, a stronger one, will allow us to face up to the security uh, challenges of this vast region, which, uh, as Dr. Jayashankar rightly reminded us, uh, that France uh, is a, we, we, we are a nation of the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and uh, the presence of uh, security at the time of the forum has been emphasized by the emergence of a coordinated maritime presence uh, of the European Union. We're working on it, and we wish this uh, coordinated maritime presence uh, to allow for greater stability of the whole of the region and a better security. That's, we want to arrive at very concrete options on the three areas of uh, this forum, security, but also connectivity and the digital. And within the framework of uh, the strategy developed by the EU, the Global Gateway, which aims at developing uh, intelligent, uh, clear-cut and safe links between the different actors, so we want this uh, Global Gateway to also apply to the Indo-Pacific and the EU wishes to strengthen the 
physical connections uh, and digital between Europe and all of uh, the Indo-Pacific. And we wish this forum to actually allow us to develop a concrete proposal in particular in the digital field, because this will be one of the subjects of the roundtable that we will be organizing. And then the global, global challenges. Uh, we'll have the opportunity of uh, evoking in the course of our conversation where India, uh, France, and Europe, in particular in the field of the blue economy, we wish for there to be a regulation, but also a valorization of the maritime issues. India will be invited at the CTEC week, uh, which will take place in September of 22 in Brest, uh, following the uh, Ocean Summit that will take place on the 11th of February, which is upon the initiative of France. But uh, the challenges of the blue economy is uh, a key one for the Indo-Pacific. And I want to reiterate that we wish to work within this forum for the emergence of a production capacity of a vaccine for all of the Indo-Pacific because the production of vaccines and health safety is a key challenge to which we can bring collective answers. We've already started to do so. And I also wish that we be able to, in the course of this forum, really use our experiences in the field of energy transition and uh, uh, be together for these common uh, rendezvous. Uh, we've already uh, worked with India in the energy field, which is absolutely essential, and we want to widen it to uh, the different challenges in the framework of the Indo-Pacific. And uh, the objective uh, of the uh, student exchange that I wanted to add uh, to this, which is already very much very strong in the Indo-French relations. We wish to extend it to uh, the Indo-Pacific uh, space, and it'll be one of the major themes that we wish to see appear in this forum with concrete results, specific initiatives, precise initiatives to come out of the general discourse and to show how this Indo-Pacific solidarity, which is emerging, be able to, uh, you know, be in identified uh, concrete actions, uh, respecting, of course, the sovereignty of each of the states of the Indo-Pacific area. Now, the Ukrainian question is not are going to penalize this political will that I have just asserted. Uh, although today this question is dominating uh, the news, we are, of course, preoccupied by the tensions that uh, exist at the frontier of Ukraine through the important deployment of Russian forces uh, at the uh, frontier of Ukraine and the Donbass, as well as uh, Belarus. Russians uh, need to know if there was any attack on the uh, sovereignty, uh, integrity of Ukraine. We cannot not act strongly, and we. But we also want that the dialogue be pursued. There was a positive element yesterday in Paris because the four uh, diplomatic advisors uh, of. Uh, the leaders of the four countries concerned by what we call the Normandy format, the aim of which is to implement the Minsk Accords and uh, the Paris Accords uh, to find serenity in Ukraine. This meeting took place, uh, although for some several months it was uh, at a dead end. This format was at an impasse. It, so it was uh, held and the different uh, Participants, uh, uh, you know, what not only the ceasefire of July 2020 be respected, but also be able to make uh, small steps in the political settlement of this crisis. Now, in the period that has just gone by, which is very tense, this is a small bit of optimism that I wanted to evoke. But the situation in Ukraine, of course, uh, will not prevent us from pursuing our will to assert an Indo-Pacific, shared Indo-Pacific strategy in which the European Union, presided over by France and India, will have a determining role to play. Uh, thank you, Minister. Uh, Dr. Jashankar, uh, you know, uh, uh, Minister Lidrio has, has laid out a very expansive roadmap and he talked about multiple uh, aspects of this relationship that the uh, French presidency would want to take forward. 
uh, I would like you to touch upon, if you can, two particular aspects, which I think are very critical and important. One is we hear a lot about the connectivity partnership and the Global Gateway Initiative. So, uh, so how do you think, uh, you know, what, what role and what expectations India has uh, from the connectivity partnership in terms of providing alternatives in the Indo-Pacific? The other element, of course, is trade, which is connected, but also different in the sense that we are looking, uh, there has been a India is, is is pursuing a lot of agreements. Uh, there are a lot of uh, ones in the offing, it seems. Uh, but uh, given uh, the uh, long-standing expectation of the India-EU trade uh, relationship, where do you see this relationship growing? And, and are, are we in for a quick uh, uh, quick trade agreement with the EU as well, or are we uh, are we looking for for some distance here in, that that needs to be travelled before we? enter into the final phases of, the, of those negotiations. So trade and connectivity, if you can touch upon those two issues. Uh, thank you. Uh, let, me, let me go with the connectivity uh, one first. You know, I was looking actually at the principles of this uh, European uh, Union's global gateway. And uh, the principles include uh, democratic values, high standards, good governance, transparency, equal partnerships for local partners, green and clean projects, resilience, catalyzing private sector. Now, the reason I mention this is if you actually look at our uh, positions on connectivity, not now, uh, positions which are uh, three, four, five years old, uh, this has been, ours has actually been a very, very similar approach where we have actually stressed the need for transparency, for commercial viability, for local ownership, for environmental, ecological respect, for respect for territorial integrity of uh, countries. Uh, so I do think about, you know, in terms of principles and outlook, uh, there's a very good fit uh, between, uh, you know, the global gateway and India's own approach to connectivity. And in fact, it is this very fit which has led to an India-EU connectivity partnership because again uh, if you look at it this is exactly what we are hoping we are discussing in the partnership. Now uh, the EU obviously has its own uh, programs and plans uh, and uh, in our own case we have also been active uh, in terms of promoting connectivity and development and uh, we, we do this you know frankly uh, uh, in, in many ways as a as a integral part of our policy it's it's very much part of our uh, especially of our south south cooperation uh, so it might actually interest you to know that uh, to date we have uh, development we have projects uh, in as many as 67 countries uh, around the world uh, and even as we speak today i'm talking of not not of small projects but of decent sized projects uh, we have actually 288 projects which are under different stages of implementation. So uh, we do our thing based on similar principles. The EU will do this. And again, the EU has been doing it for some time. They've just, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, made their policy uh, more contemporary and focused. And I find, uh, you know, the best way of... Uh, promoting international collaboration of like-minded uh, uh, countries is to work together uh, that you know uh, if to the extent we exchange notes and say in this country we are hoping to do that this is the requirement you know would you would you focus on this and we'll focus on that so there are ways of uh, shall i say maximizing the value of what you are doing if you can find a like-minded partner uh, who uh, will work in tandem with you and that is something which we would uh, very much like to do with the EU uh, and uh, with France. Uh, as regards the uh, trade issue, you know, uh, free trade agreements are very complicated because there's an enormous amount of uh, give and take across sectors. Uh, and uh, But uh, there are two particular challenges when it comes to EU one that it involves so many countries so you know you have to reconcile harmonize prioritize uh, their demands as well uh, and of course there are there are some non-trade issues which are involved in the negotiations uh, certainly uh, i think it was the expectation of the leaders last year in may 
that uh, the bureaucracy, the negotiators would uh, pick up on uh, on their uh, uh, urgency uh, and get to work because you know uh, this the uh, our negotiations really have been in a freeze uh, from 2013 uh, and uh, in 2014 uh, when there was a change of government in India uh, we actually were keen to, to resume negotiations I think there was hesitation on the European side uh, but the result, re leaders finally took that call last May so uh, we have been uh, you know my understanding is, is something in our system which is led by the commerce ministry uh, my understanding is that the negotiators have been very much in touch quite active uh, there's a you know there's a lot of things which happen uh, not doesn't necessarily have to happen formally across the conference table uh, but uh, there has been movement but obviously the expectation level is high we would like to see greater urgency faster movement i can say that we are uh, quite uh, uh, ready to to do that uh, and uh, uh, i would point to the fact that uh, there are some other negotiations which are going on with other states uh, where we've actually made a lot of progress so uh, i certainly hope that adds to our credibility uh, where brussels uh, is concerned thank you uh, minister Lidrio, if, if i can come to you for for something that you touched upon in your in your uh, presentation in your in your uh, discussion earlier which is the health partnership between india and france uh, and uh, and especially in a world shaped by covid uh, we had seen uh, France uh, responding to India's uh, requirements during the very, very, very difficult second wave. Also, India reached, uh, you know, standing up uh, with its European friends during the first wave, uh, helping out uh, wherever it, it could. Uh, I, there was this, uh, what, what possibilities do you see for this health partnership uh, between India and the EU in a, in a world that is being shaped by, by the health crisis at the moment. Uh, and also, if uh, if the EU, if France can lead the way in shaping this partnership uh, by pushing for the recognition of co-vaccine, for example, uh, among the EU member states, is, is this something on the cards or is this something that can be considered? I come back uh, to what uh, Dr. Jay Shankar was saying a while ago concerning trade and uh, concerning the resumption of discussions. This uh, was done at the time of the, the Porto summit, and there will be another summit between the EU and India in the second half of uh, this year. And uh, we are back again in a discussion. He knows this, I know this, that uh, these discussions are never very easy. The problem is to make sure there is the political will behind it, and the political will is deployed if each one sees their interest. And we are in that logic. We're back uh, on uh, to uh, negotiation. It will inevitably be a bit complicated because there are 27 member countries of the EU, and uh, with one single partner, which is India, but we've already uh, with other countries uh, been able to arrive at results and we will act in that direction the path is sometimes difficult but if the will is there we will get there we will reach coming back to health challenges uh, these are the ones that we share and that uh, we will try and treat at the level of the indo specific pacific space one of the proposals that i would uh, make during the pro forum in the month of February, in a few days' time, is to arrive at uh, that what uh, India and France, India and the EU, there be the creation of an Indo-Pacific campus in the field of health. This would be a first, and I think it would be uh, able to favor exchanges, in particular in training, innovation, there is a pharmaceutical tradition in India which is very strong in Europe and particularly in France. There is the same technological capacity and then you have the uh, need to assert that, that uh, vaccine is a common good of humanity and we have to carry this message forward together. And it, 
there to be a campus in this field, an Indo-Pacific campus that could take place in India, would be a symbol of this common will to make Indo-Pacific an area of sharing, of partnership. For the rest, I think the e European Union in the field, the fight against the pandemic was, uh, uh, has never closed our capacity to export. We have exported as many vaccines as uh, we have mobilized for our own requirements. And we have also initiated uh, a strategy of donation for countries uh, that were most in, in need, that didn't have their own production capacity. And we've also mobilized uh, all of the uh, world actors around the concept of Act A with the COVAX uh, as a financial tool to allow for uh, everybody's access to the vaccine. And we are in the logic of trying to respond to the objective that has been fixed by the World Health Organization, that is to vaccinate 70% of the population by 2023. And we must all contribute to that aim. And we are today at 50%, so there is still much ground to be covered, in particular in Africa. And I'd like to emphasize the excellent collaboration between France and India, in particular by uh, using the medicine patent pull uh, mechanism that allows for transfer of technology and avails of an office in Mumbai and uh, which <coughs> works with a lot of uh, laboratories present in India. And this is an initiative that uh, the European Union is financing and it uh, comes under the under unit aid of the UN. It's a second vector on which I think we should uh, support at the time of uh, the uh, forum in Paris. And uh, I know that the new co vaccine, uh, vaccine is studied by the EU within the framework of the European Drug Agency. And as soon as it's recognized, because it's already been homologated by WHO, and once uh, uh, it uh, is recognized by the European Drug Agency, it will be able to be used in Europe. And it will also facilitate the conversion of the validation of vaccines for all persons traveling. So we are in a positive collaboration because we have the skills, the competence, uh, all of us and uh, to make sure that the vaccine is considered as a global common, global good. Uh, Dr. Jashankar, we are in the last few minutes of this conversation, and there are a couple of uh, questions that are there from the audience, if I may put them to you. One is about uh, the possibility of Quad uh, engaging with other like-minded countries in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, you know, is there a possibility for greater part, greater role, for example, from other countries like France or even even engagement with EU how does how does how would a quad platform look at those engagements uh, the other is uh, you know uh, 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 president uh, Emmanuel Macron when he when he uh, you know in, in his address about the uh, European uh, French presidency of the EU uh, talked of Africa being at the center of uh, engagement uh, as far as uh, EU's Indo-Pacific strategy is concerned. They would like to. There is an Africa EU summit uh, which is happening in February. Uh, and uh, is there a possibility of uh, India, for example, collaborating with EU in, in third countries in Africa, uh, in, in, whether in terms of connectivity or, or other possibilities? Do they exist, or, or are, the, are those possibilities uh, certainly are, are they in the realm of uh, you know the, the possible? If if I may put it, put those questions to you uh, from the audience. Uh you know, where the Quad is concerned, uh, I can tell you so far, uh, we haven't really discussed uh, as Quad uh, engaging other countries. I mean, obviously, uh, as uh, members of Quad, we many of us have uh, trilaterals we, we do with others. Uh, but as Quad, as four, do we engage a fifth or a sixth? Uh, that's something we haven't discussed. I mean, I, I honestly do not know what the views of the other three are, uh, but in my own view right now, we need to focus it. I mean, Quad is relatively new um, and uh, we need to spend much more time developing its own agenda, looking to see 
uh, how it can be a better force for global good in the uh, Indo-Pacific. So uh, my my uh, gut inclination would be really uh, to get the Quad kind of uh, you know working uh, better, more ambitiously, more efficiently uh, right now. Uh, on your uh, second issue, uh, which is Africa, uh, look, uh, it's a it's a very very uh, important region, and I I don't mean that just as lip service. I mean uh, the fact is uh, we have uh, uh, the the Modi government has actually uh, opened eighteen new embassies. In fact, almost all the new embassies we've opened abroad are in Africa. Uh, and we've really ramped up our development uh, commitment to Africa, our training commitment to Africa. Uh, and uh, in the visits that I've paid, uh, my sense is there's a lot of work to be done there. Now, we have different historical traditions, uh, so it's not always easy to, to mix them up and say, okay, you know, let's go together to a place. I mean, it, it, it isn't as easy as that. It, life is, is much more complicated. So, but I would have an interest definitely in coordinating with what France is doing uh, on the connectivity side, on the development side, the green transition, the digital side. Uh, these are all areas definitely we could work together with a partner like France, because as I said, you know, uh, at the end of the day, for me, uh, France uh, is, a, and, and the EU are actually uh, partners with whom the big picture fits. Uh, so we'd be very, very comfortable working uh, in various regions. Uh, thank you, Minister Ludria. I think this is this would be perhaps the last question. Uh, one of the questions that has been asked uh, from one of our audience, uh, who's uh, you know who who who's uh, a member who's watching this, uh, is uh, you know when you look at the present geopolitical conflict in in Europe at the moment. Uh, Russia and China seems to be coming ever so closer together. And given the challenges that Europe uh, and, and the West the, is facing, NATO is facing, would it be not better to have some sort of a, a relationship uh, with Russia, uh, even if tactical, so that the broader challenge in the wider Indo-Pacific, which is the rise of China, can be managed? Uh, and how do you how how would you look at this uh, this uh, conundrum in terms of the changing geopolitical balance uh, in, in 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 the Indo-Pacific? And I think this is a global uh, challenge in some ways. Thank you. And. Um, uh observation of substance in the way in which uh, we uh, look at the uh, Indo, understand the Indo-Pacific uh, area. Uh, we, that is the European Union, of which uh, France is uh, carrying out the presidency. Now, we believe that we need to develop with the countries of the Indo-Pacific, with India in particular, a partnership which is respectful of sovereignties and which uh, avoids falling into forms of suggestions uh, of a uh, power over a given area, a space, and avoid falling into a kind of confrontation. And the right means of avoiding this risk is to make sure that we advance on concrete projects on the three themes that I mentioned a while ago. If we have a coordinated maritime presence, if we have uh, uh, projects of connectivity, if we have projects of uh, joint action in the health field, we are in the partnership in respect of sovereignties and uh, giving up a, uh, n not in a uh, con you know, logic of conflict or suggestion. And I think with India we can carry forward these concrete messages which uh, overcome ideological uh, you know stance of the relations between countries and ensure uh, stability in the indo-pacific area on russia we believe that russia is in europe we consider that it is uh, for russia to not behave as a power of disequilibrium that it is that is the role that is playing currently 
and that it become a power of stability. And to go in this direction, we need to come back to the fundamentals of the commitments that were taken at the time of the USSR in the Helsinki commitments on security in Europe, which assert the sovereignty of states, the unviability of um, the uh, frontiers, and uh, the right of each one to make the alliances it wishes to make. These are principles that were validated by the USSR in 1975, and uh, they were renewed by Russia in uh, 1992. So let us come back to those principles that Russia has validated in order to have a true stability in Europe, of which uh, Russia is part and parcel. And that is the message I'd like to convey, which is essential today, rather than uh, you know, uh, witnessing an alliance uh, which is a bit dangerous, and even for Russia, between uh, Russia and China. Thank you. I think we have uh, just uh, we have passed our time, and this is a very interesting conversation. And and I think what what comes out very categorically is the intent on both sides to take this relationship forward, not only bilateral India France, but I think uh, also embedded in the larger European framework. Uh, so as uh, so, we look forward to the French presidency of the EU and the accomplishments at the end of it. Uh, uh, good luck to both. Uh, uh, Minister Lidrio and Dr. Jay Shankar, and thank you for participating in this very interesting conversation. Thank you to all the audience who were here with us today and for your very interesting questions. We could not take all of them, but I, uh, but I think we took some of the more interesting ones.